Welcome to Electron Online and now we're going to talk about one of the most exciting periods in the history of the universe called the inflationary period. And the inflationary period was thought about already a long time ago to try and explain some things that could not be explained before. It was assumed that at some point very early on in the age of the universe, which now was determined to be somewhere during the electroweak era, somewhere between 10 to the minus 35 and 10 to the minus 32 seconds, the universe went through a super rapid inflation. Super rapid is really an understatement for what really happened. The universe grew in size by a factor of about 10 to the 50th. Now again, where did that number come from? That was an estimation, an assumption based on a lot of calculations, a lot of things that they looked at. And so it used to be a smaller number, but now they upped it to about 10 to 50th. That's an enormous increase in size. And I'll give you a feel of what that really is like in just a moment. But first I want to talk about why we needed something like the inflationary period. Why they believed that it had to be there, otherwise the universe could not be explained. And so let's say we look at our universe today, here we are sitting on our planet Earth, or standing in this case, but the little figure there, and the observable universe has a radius of 13.8 billion years. And we know that today we're still getting, we're still receiving radiation from the cosmic background. The cosmic background microwave radiation is still upon us, reaching us from all, re all areas of space. And so the, ra the radiation that is now imparting on the Earth has been on its way for the entire history of the universe, 13.8 billion years. And we get radiation from all directions. And what's the incredible thing about this radiation is that it all is about the same wavelength, about 1.068 millimeters, no matter where it came from. And it's been on its way for 13.8 billion years. And this incredible uniformity of that background radiation is something that's just simply beyond belief, simply beyond the possibilities of existing. How can radiation that has been on its way from 13.8 billion years and be separated from that far, that long ago, and then when it reaches the Earth, it's the exact same wavelength, no matter where it came from, that just doesn't seem possible. Because during that entire 13.8 billion years, the universe has been expanding and the wavelength has been expanding. And if there was a slight, slight, the ever so slightest difference in wavelength way back then, 13.8 billion years ago, after it's been expanded to this incredible factor of 10 to the 60th, 70th, whatever it is today, then any small difference that existed that long ago would be a huge difference today. The fact that today, after 13.8 billion years of space expansion and elongation and stretching of, these, of this radiation, the CMB radiation, it is impossible to imagine that the uniformity would be there the way it is today. So the only explanation that we can come up with at that time, that if, if somehow the universe being extremely small grew to an enormous size in an extremely small amount of time, where all the radiation that existed in the universe back then all of a sudden grew, just exploded in an enormous fast, way faster than the speed of light, just exploded into a much larger volume. And so that way the radiation that would exist there would then all be the same. So the idea is that the radiation that was coming from here and the radiation that's coming from there at some point must have been pretty well in the same place to be able to have that very same uniform wavelength. And therefore, when the universe expanded like that, the information that was contained within the very small universe was then very quickly spread over a very large region. The question is, how large was the region? There's always this question about, well, 10 to the 50th, okay, I can accept that number, maybe, but how small was it when it started, and how did it get to be as big as it was, and, and how small was it when it started, and how much bigger was it when it was multiplied times 10 to the 50th? Well, to get some kind of an idea of how big the universe may have been after inflation, let's go back to the very unitary thing that we can go down to, the smallest distance that could exist possibly in the universe, which is considered Planck time. We, re we already know that energy is quantized, mass is quantized, time is quantized, as we could see in the Planck's time. We can also imagine that distance is quantized. It must be quantized. And so we went through the calculations and we determined that there's such a thing as Planck length at 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters. That is the smallest possible distance that can exist in the universe. So the universe had to be at least Planck length in size when it began to inflate. Since the universe had already been expanding from 10 to the minus 43 seconds to 10 to the minus 36 seconds before the inflation era started, or period started, we can imagine that the universe must have been bigger than Planck length, but let's just assume for a moment that it was Planck length. 
how much bigger would the universe be that it then grew by a factor of 10 to the 50th? Well, all we have to do is multiply 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters times 10 to the 50th, and we get 1.6 times 10 to the 15th meters, or 1.6 times 10 to the 12th, oop, and I forgot, kilometers. This should be a K here, kilometers. So that would be 1.6 trillion kilometers. And to think that a light year is about 10 trillion kilometers, we then know that this size would be 16% of a light year. So that would then imply that if the universe started at a size of Planck length and it inflated over that extremely small amount of period of time to an enormous size in, in comparison, it would have grown to something in diameter of 16% of, of a light year, which is an enormous size that is much bigger than our current solar system. And assuming that it was much bigger than Planck length, 10 times as much, or 20, or 100, or 200, or 1,000 times as much, who knows? Just think how much bigger the universe would have been right after inflation. So at that point, all of a sudden, it went from a minuscule size into something much bigger. How much bigger, of course, that will be up for debate for a long time to come. So what happened during that very small period? Well, there's something else very interesting that happened. It is assumed that during that inflationary period that all the mass of the universe was generated, all the energy and mass was generated to what we have today. Of course, something else happened after that to kind of streamline that a, bit, a little bit, and we'll get into that. But at that point, mass would have been created, and this is the reasoning what, that they have. What we understand today is that with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it is possible for matter to spontaneously come about and disappear as long as it does it fast enough, as long as the uncertainty in mass and uncertainty in time is below a certain limit. And this is known as the uncertain, this is known as Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that the uncertainty in the mass multiplied times uncertainty in the time has to be smaller than or equal to h, which is Planck's constant, divided by 2 pi, divided by c squared. So the h with a line through it really means h divided by 2 pi. And then if we take the mass and move it over to the other side, and I guess I didn't do that, so let me do that here. Let's take the mass over here and put it over here. And of course, if we're going to create protons and antiprotons, then we have to take into account twice the mass of a proton, because the mass of proton and antiproton are the same. Then we can figure out how long those two particles can exist before they have to disappear and, we wouldn't, and it would not violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of the universe. And we discovered that the delta t is 10 to the minus 25 seconds. So particles can spontaneously appear and disappear and nothing in the universe would change. And we assume that that's happening all of the time. We assume that must have been happening at the very beginning when the radiation that exists in the universe had enough energy to do that. However, the problem is that when matter was created, it will instantaneously destroy itself again in a very short period of time, less than this amount of time, so that whenever a particle and a particle was created, they would immediately destroy each other, and so matter could not exist for any length of time, for anything longer than the time required to survive over the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But when inflation happened, when a particle was produced, and inflation happened so, so quickly like this, before the particle and antiparticle could destroy each other, annihilate each other by coming back together, the universe had expanded so quickly, so fast, that the particles would have moved apart such a great distance they couldn't meet again and destroy each other. And so the assumption is that at that split moment, when the universe was seething with particles as being created and destroyed in the Virgil pair production sense, that all of a sudden the universe expanded so quickly that the particles couldn't reunite, and all of a sudden, bang, all the mass of the universe was there. Matter and antimatter in enormous quantities, way more than was existing in the universe today, and we'll see why. And so that happened because the universe grew to this enormous size. Now, having that much mass in the universe, and the universe maybe being a light year or 10 light years, 100 light years across, is so small compared to what it is today, the universe must have been extremely dense at that moment. But if you want to see what happened next, stay tuned, I'll show you some more, more examples of that. So, what we can conclude here is that in this moment of rapid expansion, the information that was contained within a very small volume was also spread over a very large volume in such a way that the CMB, that cosmic microwave background radiation, can be exactly the same no matter where it came from, today, 13.8 billion years later, and explain why matter can also exist where there wasn't a, a way to exist before, because whenever matter is created in pairs of matter and antimatter, they would immediately destroy each other, and so matter couldn't exist until this rapid inflation had occurred. 
So this inflation period, even though no one could explain how it happened and no one could really prove that it happened, it must have happened, otherwise the universe could not have existed. Well, they wanted to prove how it happened and some theorists came, came up with some really good ideas saying that this, the radiation that existed at that very early stage of the rapid inflation must have been affected by this inflation and they started making some calculations and they, they surmised that the radiation should have been polarized, had a very specific polarization signature and so they began to look for that polarization signature. They began to look at this cosmic background radiation that was detected in the 1960s with very careful instruments and sure enough just a few years ago and it was just announced just a few months ago from, from the time they're making this video that yes they had found that characteristic polarization signature that they were looking for therefore very strong proof because of the polarization that's detected that the CMB actually existed during that inflation period and that that inflation period actually did happen. So not only do we need it to explain the theory, we're now beginning to find observational evidence that such an inflation period actually did happen. An amazing thing, the thing that started the universe in motion, the thing that started, that allowed us, that allowed, not us, but the universe to generate all the matter that exists today.